Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Natalie Kassoon. I'm one of the child abuse pediatricians in San Antonio, Texas. And today I'm going to be talking to you about recognizing child abuse. Are my slides up? Yes. Okay. So we're gonna talk a little bit first about how common child abuse is. So these statistics are from 2018. Nationally in the United States, 4.3 million reports were made to Child Protective Services. Of those, 678,000 children were thought to be victims of child maltreatment. The most common form of child maltreatment is neglect, followed by physical abuse, sexual abuse, and then other types, such as being threatened abused by a parent or caregiver, parents' drug and alcohol abuse, or safe relinquishment of a newborn. When we look at the kinds of child maltreatment each child suffers, most commonly, again, because neglect is the most common form of child maltreatment, that one type of child maltreatment and most of that is neglect. Others uh, are physical abuse and then sexual abuse. Neglect and physical abuse is the most common combination. When we think about which children are most likely to have uh, to be abused, we think it's uh, the data reflects that it's the younger age group. So it's the kids who are at home with parents most dependent on adults to do things for them. They're the young nonverbal children. So for most of my talk, I'm gonna be focusing on how to recognize child abuse in these young children. When we look at who is most likely to perpetrate abuse, parents, and again, because we're talking about these young nonverbal children, who are the people who have most access to them? They are their parents, who are the ones most responsible for them? They are their parents. So they're the ones who are most likely to be determined as the reason that this child has been abused or neglected. Then we have a non-parent relative, so those living in the household who aren't related to them, uh, who are related to them, like a grandma, auntie, uncles, things like that, and then other, which are non-relatives, babysitters, foster siblings, foster parents, things like that. Nationally in America, about four children die every day as a result of child abuse. That adds up to 1,700 children per year. And again, not surprisingly, most of those fatalities are those young nonverbal children. So next, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and what I do to try to explain why I'm able to give you this information. So I'm a child abuse pediatrician. A child abuse pediatrician is a subspecialty of general pediatrics. So what that means is I went to college, so undergrad, then I did four years of medical school. At the end of medical school, everyone comes out and is a doctor, but they're not a certain kind of doctor yet. Then I did three years of a pediatric residency. That's where I learned how to become a pediatrician. After you finish residency, anyone can go out and practice being a pediatrician. So that's where you take your children for well child checks or for sick care visits. But I didn't want to do that. So I decided to focus on child abuse. So after my residency, I did additional three years of training called fellowship, where every day, all day for three years, the only children that I evaluated were those kids where there was a concern for abuse or neglect. So during those three years, I did complete medical evaluations for any child when there was a concern for abuse. That means looking at taking a full history, just like they do at the regular doctor's office, doing a full physical exam, head to toe, looking at all of the skin, all of the body parts, just like they do at the regular doctor's office, looking at lab work, ordering lab work, looking at x-rays, and then at the end of all of that, looking at all of that information and trying to determine whether the situation or the injury that this child has is due to child abuse or a medical problem or an accident or something else that we need to find out. I work really closely with Child Protective Services and law enforcement. And when I write my note, I realize that what I write down is most likely going to be read by other non-medical professionals such as lawyers, such as social workers, child protective services, law enforcement, attorneys, right? So I write it in such a way where there's, uh, it's, people are able to understand it if you're not in the medical field. I also go to court and testify as an expert witness in civil and criminal cases. And so that's in general what a child abuse pediatrician does. So now we're gonna move on and we're gonna talk a little bit about the different kinds of abuse. 
So the first thing, I'm sorry, first thing we're gonna talk about is mandated reporting and what that means. Now, every state in the US has mandated reporting. The laws regarding it is a little different. Uh, every country also has some form of mandated reporting. Uh, most countries in the world do. I'm not sure, I don't know the rules for those. So I'm just gonna talk about mandated reporting in general in the United States and a little bit more specifically for Texas. So the reason the United States has mandated reporting is because of something called the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, or CAPTA. So this was originally passed in 1974, and basically what it says is that all of the states need to come up with some way to gather reports and investigate any concerns for child maltreatment. And this was passed first in 1974, and subsequently every time it's come up to say, do we still wanna do this? the government had said, yes, we're gonna to continue to do this because we know it's in the best interest of children. So in general, all of the states have language that says something like this. Any person who's engaged in the examination, care and treatment of persons, so notice they don't say just children, they say persons, so adults and children are mandated reporters. And some states have actual lists of who are mandated reporters. But if you work in some, some capacity where you're taking care of and seeing social work, teaching, um, uh, law enforcement, uh, medical fields, all of those, you're going to be a mandated reporter in every single state, not just here in Texas. Now in Texas, every citizen is a mandated reporter. And again, that's not the same for everywhere. Um, some states have just specific, specific things, but in Texas, every person is a mandated reporter. And it's important to know that even if you live in a state where you're not listed as being a mandated reporter, you can still report child abuse. So you don't have to be a mandated reporter in order to report child abuse. The mandated part basically just says if you don't report it, then you can actually get in trouble. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So when should you report? Every state has language that says something like this. Whenever you suspect a child is being physically abused, sexually abused and neglected. So the point is suspect. You don't actually have to know that the abuse is happening before you report it because we are not investigators. We only know very little about a family, what they want to show us when they come into contact with us. We're not in their home. So you don't actually know what's happening. So we will most often will not actually have definitive evidence that something is happening. We just have a suspicion and a suspicion is absolutely enough to make a report to Child Protective Services. When you call them, you wanna give them as much information as possible because you're calling them and telling them, go out and find this person who lives somewhere in my state, um, in my city, in my, you know, where, in my county. And so you wanna give them as much information as possible, who the child is, who the parents are, who else is living in the home, contact information, a good address if you have it. So all of these things, because they're not gonna be able to go out and investigate and find out what's going on if they don't know how to find this family. And as I said, you only have to have a suspicion. So it's okay if you don't know, because every state has laws that protect you uh, from from um, liability from these parents, if they're angry because a report was made to Child Protective Services, that if you make a report in good faith, then you're not, you can't get in trouble because you were trying to protect the child and that's more important. Um, but if you, if you make a report and you're trying to get someone in trouble, well, that's a little different. So the focus for reporting to Child Protective Services is keeping a child safe not really what's going to happen to the parent and who you're getting in trouble. Because again, you don't actually know what's happening in the home because you're not in the home. And so you wanna be sure that you're thinking about how to protect that child the best way that you can. And again, I talked about this mandated, people being mandated. So that only means that if you don't report it and you're a mandated reporter, you can actually get in trouble because the government feels that if you come in such close contact with children and adults who have children, that you are obligated if you have a suspicion to report. And if you don't, then that's not living up to your civic duty. Um, and so you can get in trouble. Here in the state of Texas, it's a class A misdemeanor, which means a fine and jail time. So it just, um, every state is a little different, but there is some version of this in most states in, the, in, in this country. 
Now, every state also has laws that says that CPS can't tell the family who calls. The reason that is, is because again, they don't, it's not a punitive thing. They don't want anybody to get in trouble because they're making a report because they're concerned about the safety of a child. And so by law, they can't tell a family who calls. However, some families can figure it out based on what the allegations are and who they've talked to and who they've interacted with recently. If you're a professional or anyone really, when you give your name and position and how you know this family and how you come in contact with them, it can add credibility to your concern. And also it gives the investigator the opportunity to come back and check in with you and make sure they understand what your concerns are and potentially follow up with you once they have discussed with the families whether you still have concerns based on the information that they have gathered through their investigation. You can make the decision whether or not to tell the family and it really depends on your relationship with the family. As a physician and a pediatrician, if I'm making a report to Child Protective Services, I always tell my families what, what's going on. And I explain it to them as this, something has happened to your child and I'm worried that someone has hurt them. I don't know who did it. And it's not my job to figure out who or how. That job is what Child Protective Services, that's what their investigation does. And the reason you wanna tell the person who you're talking with, the caregiver you're talking to is so that they're not blindsided and it shows that you're in partnership with them. And I just think about what it would be like if I'm sitting in my house and Child Protective Services knocks on my door and I have no idea what I've done or what the concern is or where is this coming from that someone is now asking me what's going on with my child. You don't know if the person you're talking to is the person who has caused this injury or this situation to this child. The things they may be telling you may be the truth as they know it. And so our job is not to try to hide something from them. It's to be full disclosure. Here's what's going on. Here's what I'm worried about. My job by law is to keep this child safe. And here's what I have to do in order to do that. So really the bottom line is our job is to protect children. Making a report to Child Protective Services is not a punishment for anyone. It is our way to make sure that children are safe. And if you keep that in mind, I think it would, it helps you sort of get over that, well, someone's gonna get in trouble or what if they take that child away? So from my experience working with Child Protective Services in now three different states, removing children is not the first thing that they do. It's actually the very last thing that they choose to do um, if they've exhausted all other options. And so it's definitely not a punishment for families. You don't know what other services CPS can offer, lots of services to families. And so they can help them in ways that we might not be able to. Uh, and they're not gonna know that they need that help unless they're able to get in and see that family. So make a report to Child Protective Services if you have a suspicion. Now, if you go online, you can just Google child abuse and neglect report and in your state will come up. There's usually a hotline. Most states also now have an online way to do that. And so that's how you find out how you make that report and where you need it to. Typically the online reports are used for things that are not urgent. So you're not afraid that a child is imminently in danger. And so you can do an online report because it just takes time for someone to get to it, but then make a report in person by phone um, if it's something that you're worried about imminently and needs an immediate response for child safety. And at the end of this, we're gonna, um, I will take all of your questions. So just make sure that, you know, write your questions in the chat and we can talk about those at the end. So next we're gonna talk about the different kinds of child abuse and how to recognize those. So first, just a general definition of what child abuse is. And this is the federal definition. Every state has their own version of this, but it all includes something like this. Any recent act or failure to act on the part of a parent or caretaker, which results in death, serious physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse or exploitation, or an act or failure to act, which presents an imminent risk of serious harm. So notice in this definition, it's a harm actually happened or a serious risk of imminent harm. So in many cases, you don't have to have injury or actual harm being done before, uh, before it can determine child abuse. If you put a child at significant risk of harm, 
For example, allowing a two-year-old to wander the street, even if the two-year-old did not wasn't injured during that incident, the risk of harm was so high that that is still considered neglect and will still be substantiated by child protective services. So first, then we're going to talk about physical abuse. So physical abuse is any non-accidental or inflicted injury. So this includes cutaneous, so things on the skin like bruises, burns, bites, lacerations, so cuts, those things. It also includes broken bones like fractures. It also includes things like head injuries or abdominal injuries. So any physical injuries that can happen to a child. And when we think of physical abuse from the medical standpoint, we don't think about whether someone intended to hurt their child. And, and I think from the standpoint of someone who's suspicious of physical abuse, our job is not to think of whether someone intended to. That's something that CPS and law enforcement investigative services, that's their job is to figure out. And then they can look at the laws, the family code and the criminal code and determine whether intent and, and what needs to happen there. Our job again is to think about what's best for this child and the safety of this child. So if an adult caused an injury to a child, that could be concerning for physical abuse. And then once the investigation happens, then they can determine whether that's something that reaches the level that they can say, yep, definitively this is physical abuse or not. So when should you have a suspicion of physical abuse? So here are some things that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about where the injury is and that there are parts of the body that kids don't typically get injured during accidental things. We're gonna talk about patterned injuries and the fact that kids don't typically get injured in a pattern during accidents. We're gonna talk about the age and development of a child. So thinking about what kids can and cannot do and what kinds of injuries that leads to. And then we're gonna talk about the history. So what do we know about the injury that this child has? So first, I told you that there are certain locations on the body that lots of kids get injured. So those places aren't concerning for physical abuse. And then there are places on the bodies where kids don't typically get injured. So the way that we know this is by experience, of course, so seeing lots and lots of children and seeing where they typically get injured. But we've actually done research looking at this. So looking at thousands of children going to their pediatrician's office just for a checkup. So no reason they're not coming in because they have an injury. And then we wrote down, researchers wrote down where on their bodies they have injuries. And the places that we consider to be very concerning are the places where less than 2% of children, just all children, all ages, coming to the pediatrician's office get injured or had injuries. And so these are places that we know are less likely to happen during accidental ways. So these are the places that kids, when we see them, we don't, we're not concerned for abuse because kids get injured here all the time. So when we think about children, you think about how they explore their world, right? They're full force going forward. When they fall, they fall forward. The places that, I'm that I have listed up here are the places where the skin and the bone are really close together. And so the way that you get an injury is when you crush your skin against a bony surface. And so we have the forehead, right? Lots of kids get goose eggs from falling all the time. Their nose, that gets hit. Their chin, their elbows, forearms their hip bones there, their knees and their shins. So those are places when kids are running around and playing on a playground, having a good time, they get bruises there all the time. And when I see those, it doesn't make me concerned that abuse is happening. However, these places on this list, when I see these, I'm really concerned about abuse because these aren't places that typically children will hurt themselves when they're, when they're just having normal routine play and activity. So we think about their chest. So kids at about 15 months of age start putting their hands out to protect themselves when they fall. So they're less likely to impact their chest when they fall down. Their back, so kids tend to, if they fall backwards, they sit on their bottom. Um, again, they put their hands out to protect themselves, so they're less likely to impact their back. Their belly or their abdomen. So again, this is a very protected area. They put their hands out. It's also very soft. And so because it's very soft, we don't have that bone for the skin to crush against to cause that bruise. It takes a lot more force and energy to cause a bruise there and a lot more force than you typically see from normal routine accidents that happen with kids who are just playing. The genitals and the buttocks, again, 
very well protected. Now, when we think about those young nonverbal kids who are wearing diapers, their genitals or buttocks even more well protected. And so they're less likely to get injured there because that's just not where they impact. I talked about kids when they fall down backwards, they fall on their buttocks a lot. Again, those young nonverbal kids, they have clothing on, they have diapers on, not going to get injured. The buttocks is a soft, cushy place. Again, it takes a lot of force to cause that. We see lots and lots of kids who fall down all the time on their butt, on the playgrounds, jumping from swings, landing on their butt, no bruises at all. So it takes a lot of force to cause an injury there. Now, I'm just going to step out a little bit from this very concerning location to talk about buttock bruising. So in the United States, corporal punishment is legal, and that is, you know, hitting a child as a form of discipline. However, in most states, if you leave an injury, that's considered physical abuse. The reason is we know that the amount of force it causes to take to cause a bruise is excessive physical discipline and is outside the realm of what can be considered normal corporal punishment. Now, as a pediatrician, I have to say that pediatricians have recommended no corporal punishment at all. The reason that we do that is because we know that corporal punishment does not actually change behaviors and it actually causes more harm than good. So we have done over 700 studies looking at corporal punishment, trying to find whether or not this, is, this can be helpful for children. Not one study has found a positive impact on children as a result of corporal punishment. Every single study has found negative effects. What it does is it causes fear in children. It damages the parent-child relationship. And so parents, children are afraid to tell their parents things, even things that they should tell their parents because they're worried that they're going to get hit and hurt. It causes aggression in children because of modeling. So children who see that the way that you solve a problem, if someone does something inappropriate that you hit them, that's how they will uh, engage with their world also because children learn by watching us and seeing what we do. And so um, it also causes anxiety. It also causes depression. When we look at adults, uh, correlation with corporal punishment with substance and alcohol abuse. And so corporal punishment in general is not recommended by a pediatrician. And even though it is legal here in the United States, again, if it is something that is used and leaves an injury, then that is concerning for physical abuse because that's excessive corporal punishment. So the next part of the body that we're concerned, if you see a bruise that's concerning, is the ears. Because again, the ears are well protected. When you fall on your side, you hit the top of your head, you hit your shoulder, you rarely ever hit your ear. Your neck, again, a well protected area. In your mouth, so kids don't typically get injuries in their mouth, especially the young, non-mobile babies who aren't moving very much, they can't put their finger in their mouth and cause an injury. And so this is from forceful insertion of an object, a pacifier, a bottle, a spoon, a toy. Uh, kids don't do that themselves. They're not strong enough to do that themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, do weird accidents happen? Absolutely. But again, as the person who's starting at the very beginning of the process, who doesn't know everything about that family, our job is not to say, well, this must be a weird accident because this is a very nice family or I don't want to get them in trouble. Our job is to think, well, this is a concerning place for a kiddo to have an injury. I have to keep make sure this kid is safe. I need to make a report to Child Protective Services. Other place is the angle of the jaw, so right along the side. Your cheeks are soft and cushy. There's not a lot of bone right there in the middle of your cheeks, so it takes a lot more force to cause an injury there. They're also a well-protected area. Your eyelids and subconjunctival hemorrhages, so your eyes in general. I'm talking about bleeding on the white parts of your eyes. That's what subconjunctival hemorrhages mean. And so your eyes are well protected because it's sunk in into your face. And so when you fall down, you don't typically directly impact your eyes. And so when you have injury to your eyes, you make the concern that you have some sort of direct blow and we need to figure out how that direct blow happened. Now I've mentioned a couple times, weird accidents can happen and that is absolutely true but we don't start with this was a weird accident. We always start with, well, this is concerning. Let's get some more information through a good investigation. And maybe at the end, we'll make a determination that this is a weird accident. So now patterned injuries. So most every patterned injury is suggestive of impact with an object. Um, most accidents, when you impact an object, 
the reason that it's not usually patterned is because of the chaos theory. When, you, when you're having an accident, lots of things are moving and going at the same time. So you don't typically impact something just so to get a pattern. And so when we see a pattern, it makes us worry that they had very good contact um, with a lot of force with an object. My job, even when I see a pattern as a pedi child abuse pediatrician who makes assessments about abuse and neglect, I don't ever try to figure out or give CPS, it was definitely this thing that caused the injury. Unless a child tells me that something caused the injury on them and it looks like that thing caused the injury on them, then I'm gonna say, okay, yeah, this caused this injury. But I look at the pattern and I, I can give them information about it. So if it's an injury that wraps around the child's body, I think, okay, it must be a flexible object because it had to wrap around. Or if I see a texture on it, I think, oh, that's, sort, that's a textured thing. We should look for a textured thing. That sort of looks like the bottom of my shoe or a shoe that I've seen before. So things like that. So I can talk about it, but I never give, I definitively this caused this injury unless someone tells me that this is what caused that injury. And I say, oh yeah, that looks like that. Now, do I have cases where someone said this caused that injury and then I look at the injury and I'm like, I don't see that this caused that injury. Definitely, I can see that. Does it mean that either thing is untrue, that this child was impacted with an object and that this object caused, an in, that this object was used? No, it just means the pattern doesn't match the thing that they're telling me. And I'm able to say that because again, I'm not trying to find abuse. I'm trying to make sense of what I'm seeing in this child. The next thing is the age and development. So again, researchers have looked at lots and lots of kids. And what we find is the younger a child is, the less likely they are to have an injury. And that totally makes sense because kids, when they're really young and they're not moving around, they're not interacting with the world unless the world interacts with them. And so routine care and handling of an infant should never result in an injury, right? There's nothing about an infant's skin that makes them more susceptible to bruising than an adult or an older child. And so nothing about routine care and handling should result in an injury. So if you have a young child who's not mobile, and when I say not mobile, I think about not yet crawling and they have an injury, any injury, no matter how small it is, no matter what it looks like, that is concerning for physical abuse because they should have zero injuries because they're not interacting with the world. Now, when they start to be mobile, so crawling, pulling to a stand, cruising, then you start thinking about again, how do kids fall down and those very concerning locations that when it comes, that's when it comes into play about where you wanna be concerned about where an injury is. And then we talk about the history. So of course, if a child tells you that they're being hit, um, and it left a physical injury, that's physical abuse. Um, if a child is disclosing that they've been hit, you should make a report to Child Protective Services. A physical injury that results during a domestic violence episode is physical abuse here in the state of Texas. And in many states, they look at it like that. And so that is something that needs to be reported to Child Protective Services. And of course, we know that there are lots of reasons that kids don't tell about what's going on with them at home. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what those reasons are. And so it's okay if you ask a child what happened and they tell you something or they don't tell you. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's abuse. It just means that they're not ready to tell you or that they're afraid to tell you something. If it's in a concerning location, if it's an immobile child, if it's a pattern injury, those are reasons that you should make a report to Child Protective Services so that we can get more information and try to figure out what's going on and make sure that that child is actually safe. So getting the history, it's okay to ask a kid about it. Um, if you can, don't ask with the parents present in case they're the person who, the people who caused the injury. You don't wanna ask leading questions. So what I mean by leading questions is don't say, well, your mom hit you, right? Right, you don't wanna ask them what happened. Just ask things like, what happened? How'd you get that boo-boo, buddy? What's going on? So very open-ended questions. Give the child the opportunity to let you know what's going on. And if they tell you something and it doesn't seem to make sense with you, that's fine. You don't need to interrogate that child and say like, you're lying, you're not telling me the truth. If you continue to have a suspicion after you've asked a question, make the report to Child Protective Services so they can investigate and figure out more what's going on. So be concerned if the child discloses physical abuse, if they have injuries on the e, um, on those locations that we talked about, 
the chest, the ears, the neck, the back, the, the genitals, the buttocks, in the mouth. Um, any infant with a bruise is concerning for abuse. If they have a patterned injury, that's concerning. And of course, if they tell you that something bad is happening to them. So we talked about neglect being the most common form of child maltreatment. And it's really hard to define, and so there's actually no definition. So you wanna think about neglect as something that parents didn't do versus child abuse is something that they did do. So the way I think about it, it's something that's minimally necessary for the safety, growth, and development of a child. Now, there are different kinds of neglect, right? We can think about it in different ways. So active neglect is intentionally not doing something, so they're not taking full responsibility, versus passive neglect, so that's unintentional failure. And so that can be because of lots of different reasons. Again, whether it's active or passive, our job is not to determine that. Our job is to make sure that the kids are safe and Child Protective Services will do a further investigation and make, um, make adjudications based on that. Lots of different forms of neglect, such as lack of supervision, um, inadequate food, clothing, or shelter, educational neglect, medical neglect, and then other forms of neglect that the state may have too. Now, I wanna take a moment to talk about domestic violence quickly. Uh, domestic violence is a form of neglect. The reason that we know that is because, that we think that way is because children who live in homes with domestic violence are physically abused and neglected at a rate 15 times higher than the national average. For a young child, witnessing assault against their mothers is associated with more symptoms than any other type of trauma, including assault sustained by themselves. 12% of children present during a violent episode are injured. And so exposure to domestic violence is very concerning for neglect. And what Child Protective Services looks at is the different kinds of exposures, the way they've been exposed. And so our job, again, is not to make determinations about this. If we're concerned that domestic violence is going on and there are children in the home, then that's a, that's a home that should be reported to Child Protective Services so they can investigate and make sure that those kids are safe. So lastly, I wanna to talk to you about sexual abuse and your next session is going to be about sexual abuse. So I'm gonna go a little bit fast on this one. So this is the uh, federal definition of sexual abuse. And again, every state has their version of this. It's the employment, use, persuasion, inducement, enticement, or coercion of any child to engage in or assist any other person to engage in any sexually explicit conduct or simulation of such conduct for the purpose of producing a visual depiction. Uh, the rape, and in cases of caretaker, interfamilial relationships, statutory rape, molestation, prostitution, or other forms of sexual exploitation of children or incest with children. So lifetime prevalence of unwanted sexual experience for girls is about 25%. For boys, it's about 10%. Girls are more likely to abuse than boys, but we think that that number is a little bit skewed because girls are more likely to report sexual abuse than boys are. And girls are more likely to be sexually assaulted during their teen years than any other time. Risk factors for sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is not like physical abuse where we think it happens in lower socioeconomic status more commonly or neglect. Sexual abuse can really happen in all socioeconomic classes and ethnic groups. Some things that increase the risk are disabilities in the children, children who are pre-verbal, and of course, having a very chaotic household with multiple caregivers present. So some things about sexual abuse that people think but aren't true, that the perpetrators are strangers. In reality, most perpetrators of sexual abuse are known to the child and known to the family. Perpetrators who sexually abuse boys don't sexually abuse girls. Most perpetrators are not specific to anything. They're situational. So if a situation arises that they can do something, then they do it. So it doesn't matter whether it's a boy or a girl. Children will tell you what's going on immediately. That's not true, and we're gonna talk about why not. Children tell fantasies. So we know that children don't typically make up fantasies about sexual abuse, and that's done based on years of research looking at how kids fantasize. And when kids fantasize, they fantasize about things that are good for them, that make them the hero, and sexual abuse does not make children the hero. So they don't fantasize about sexual abuse. Also, children can't fantasize about something that they haven't had experience with. And so they've either been exposed to something inappropriate or something inappropriate has happened to them as a result for them to give you a disclosure of sexual abuse. And then any child victim with penetration will have an abnormal exam. And that's not true. We're gonna talk about that too. 
So every child has sexual behaviors. It's along the spectrum of normal behaviors. There are some sexual behaviors that are normal and some that are abnormal. So this researcher looked at sexual behaviors and described them in normal children. And this is a graph that he made looking at boys and girls and the amount, the frequency of sexual behaviors they have. And what he found was both boys and girls have the same frequency, same amount of sexual behaviors. And that at about between somewhere three to five, there's this big peak and then it starts to go down. And he stopped looking at 12. But we know in adolescence, those sexual behaviors increases because of going through puberty. So the key to get from this is that both boys and girls have sexual behaviors and that it is very common. And we have a big peak in that three to five year range. Now, normal sexual behaviors in kids can be influenced by their surroundings. So how old they are, who do they live with, what happens, how do they talk about sexuality in their homes, do people walk around naked and it isn't a big deal in their house. All of this will influence what's a normal sexual behavior for a child. The most frequent normal sexual behaviors are self-stimulation, exhibition, exhibitionism, and behaviors related to personal boundaries. So those are the kids who get too close, they're close talkers, or they touch people in you know, touch breasts or buttocks when they when it seems inappropriate. Again, they just have problems with boundaries and those can be very normal, especially in those young kids because they haven't learned what those are yet. Self-stimulation, so masturbation, very common behavior, not abnormal, does not mean sexual abuse. It means it feels good and the kids are self-stimulating. We tend to see it a lot when kids are falling asleep, when they're tired, when they're stressed out. The best way to handle it is to ask them to go, if they need to do that, they can go to a private space, do that, wash their hands when they're finished, or you can ask them to stop. Usually most kids are, are can be distracted from normal sexual behaviors because they're transient, they respond to redirection, and um, if it's between children, it's not coercive, it's very cooperative, they each wanna do it. I'll show you yours, you know, not coercive or aggressive. So there's not any single sexual behavior that indicates sexual abuse. We have to look at all of the things in context. Um, abnormal sexual behaviors can also be just a part of other behavioral problems. So what makes you concerned? If it represents a sudden change in behavior, if it's persistent, if it's aggressive, and if it's imitative of adult sexual behaviors. So the way we find out about sexual abuse in my field, most of the time is that the child tells. However, it takes about two years for a child to tell. Someone witnesses the abuse is very rare. The perpetrator confesses again, very rare. And then the kids actually have symptoms or injuries. Those again are very, very rare. So a kid telling is the most important thing. So of course, if a kid tells you or if they're having abnormal sexual behaviors, you should suspect sexual abuse. Now, when someone tells you about sexual abuse, you may feel completely overwhelmed. And so a couple things I wanna tell you about. Most cases, the physical exam findings is completely normal. Reason is that most abuse may not involve something that causes an injury. Also that part of the body is made to stretch and accommodate. So it might not get injured. It also heals really quickly. So even if it gets injured, it healed before I can see them because again, kids take on average two years to tell what's going on. So it looks completely normal. And so the reason that I do a medical evaluation is not so much so that I can find evidence that this happened is because I can find out what's really going on for the, with that child. My job is to be a trusted and neutral party. I look for injuries. I look for sexually transmitted infections. I look for pregnancy. I make referrals to other medical professionals, psychological referrals. And I reassure them that even though this bad thing happened to them, their body is healthy and normal. And nobody would know something happens to them without, by looking at them, because I can't tell by looking. And I'm, and I'm looking to see if something happened to you. So reassuring the child and their family that their bodies are healthy and normal. So the absence of physical findings does not rule out the possibilities of sexual abuse. So what do you do if a child discloses to you? Believe them, listen to them. Tell them they did the right thing by telling you. Do not interview them. Don't ask all the questions you're so you want to find out because we all want to find out so that we can do the best and help we can. Don't do that. That's what child protective services and law enforcement is for. Document what they're saying. Document the context of their disclosure. Did you ask them a question or did they just come up and tell you? Report it to child protective services to law enforcement. Reasons kids don't tell is because when they're really young, they might not know what's happening to them is bad. 
They might have been threatened. They might have been said, told this is a secret. They feel trapped and helpless. They don't, they fear that people aren't going to believe them. They feel responsible. Children at that age, at a young age, everything is their fault. And so they feel like it's their fault. They want to protect their family. Even the offending person they want to protect because they love them because they're their family. So sexual behaviors do not necessarily mean child abuse, but they can. So you have to look at the context of it. Disclosure is the most important part of a sexual abuse evaluation. And if a child discloses to you, control your emotions and make the necessary reports. The last thing I want to leave you with, and this is something you're going to talk about a lot in your next session, is how to protect children from sexual abuse. One thing we can do as a general is use appropriate language. So use the right names for all the body parts to make sure that kids know how to talk to you about their bodies. Don't tell them they're not allowed to say those words. Don't make it bathroom words. Give them the opportunity to talk to you about anything they want to talk to you about, about their own bodies in this time and space they feel comfortable telling you about it. Don't force affection. So hugs and kisses, especially here in South Texas, that's just part of our culture. However, when you force someone to hug someone that makes them uncomfortable or kiss someone that makes them uncomfortable, you take away their autonomy and you let children know that it's okay sometimes to let people do uncomfortable things to their bodies. So suggest instead that they can give high fives or handshakes or waves from afar. Give them that autonomy for their body so that they don't feel like they have to do something uncomfortable. It doesn't give them the idea that adults can do things that they don't want them to do. Explain what safe and unsafe touches are and make sure you control their media exposure. Children today have lots of things they can see and hear. And if they're exposed to sexually explicit material, they will play in a sexually explicit way. And so we want to make sure we don't do that. All right. That's the end. I know I went a little bit over. I'm sorry. Um, let me see what questions there are. Certificate. Okay. Okay. Um, a question. My sister was told that she will get a visit from CPS because my niece is not eating well. She's 16. My sister is all scared. Why the doctor is telling her that she has pancreatitis and she eats just that sometimes she won't want to. So again, um, it, it, I don't know the aspects of the case. And so it just depends on if Child Protective Services visits and they talk to the physician and they find a medical reason for the reason that, you're, um, that your niece is not eating, then that's, they just find the medical reason. If there's something else going on, then they, they would find, they would do, they have interventions that they can take. So again, I know your sister is worried, but they will do a full investigation and it won't be just come in and say, oh, she's not eating. And there you go at the end of it. It will be a full investigation. Well, they'll talk to the physicians. They'll ask you what's going on with her medical health. So it won't be, um, it won't be like that. Should pictures be taken of physical injuries noticed on a child? So um, from a medical standpoint, we definitely take photographs. Child Protective Services take photographs. Law, law enforcement take photographs. If you're able to take photographs, you can definitely do so. I want to caution you, photographs that are on sensitive areas of the body, um, that it might not be the best thing for you to do. If you're making a report for child protective services because you're worried about an injury, they are going to be taking photographs. So that would be something um, as long as they're responding to it in a timely manner and the injuries are going to be gone but, uh, there. But if you're worried the injuries are going to be gone, then you can certainly take photographs. Um, what if a caseworker quickly says, well, children that age don't really know anything when the kids do talk very well and understand things? So again, you need to, when you express your concern, that is all you can do is to express your concern, make a report. Unfortunately, we can't control what CPS does with the information. And so if they choose to not investigate, or they choose to not do a good investigation because these are human beings doing investigations. And I like to think all of them do a really great job, but as we all know, there are some people who don't. We can't control that. So if you continue to have a concern, I would make another report and another report and continue giving your, um, reporting your concerns uh, because that's the only way we have to keep that child safe and we can't control what CPS does. So don't let what you think the response is going to be affect whether or not you make a report. 
Um, there's there's a question up at the top. What happens? Yes, I see it. Okay. What happens if CPS tells the family who called? Is there a consequence for them? So CPS legally cannot tell the family who called. Now, a family may come back and say, CPS told me you called. That may be them trying to find out who called. So it's not necessarily that CPS told them. It's that the family is trying to fish and find out who called. That's what I've found most often is that they don't know. Um, they didn't. They, they the CPS didn't tell them. They're just trying to figure out. So they come and they say, "I know you called CPS," and it's like, I and sometimes it is you, and because you know that you called, you feel like, okay, yeah, CPS told them. But a lot of times it's the parents, and sometimes again they can figure it out because of the circumstances of it. Um, again, that should not um, prevent you from calling uh, legal. If you think CPS caseworker did tell the family who called you should call their supervisor. If the supervisor isn't responsive, call the person above them and keep calling the person above, above them until you get the response. But I will caution you that some families say that, but they don't actually know it. They say that as a way to try to find out um, and see if they can find out who made the phone call because they're at, the, at, at some points they're trying to you know, find someone to blame for what's happening in their lives. Next question, how would someone figure out emotional or mental abuse from a parent? I understand physical abuse, but if the child is still with the parent while asking questions, how is that figured out as far as mental and emotional abuse? Right, so mental and emotional abuse are much harder um, determinations to make. So the way that that is determined is if this child is having psychological effects. So are they having behavioral problems as a result? Are they having depression? Are they having anxiety? And so again, at the very beginning, it's very difficult for like me, I'm not a, a psychologist to a psychiatrist to figure that out. And so I would say that if the child is telling me things that it's concerning for the way that a parent is talking with them and they, they, they tell me that they feel like their parents don't love them or they feel worthless or things like that, I would report to CPS and say, I'm concerned about emotional abuse. And then as part of their investigation, CPS is going to, CPS talks to the child alone, to the parent alone. They talk to other people in the child's sphere to see how the behaviors are. Um, they might get a psychological evaluation for the child. So those are ways that they determine that. So if you are concerned about it, absolutely make a report with the reasons that you're concerned about it, um, knowing that it's definitely harder to show but if you're concerned about emotional abuse, chances are there's lots of other things going on in the home and CPS investigation is probably um, would be helpful to that family. How does CPS justify using testimony of a three-year-old against an adult? Even open-ended may want to tell you what you want to hear and keep changing stories. So I'm guessing that means in relation to sexual abuse. So we know that Children don't tell fantasies about sexual abuse. So if a three-year-old is making a disclosure that is concerning for sexual abuse, that warrants further investigation. Now, depending on the development of a three-year-old, we the, the investigative process, there's something called a forensic interview. The forensic interview is conducted by someone who's specifically trained to talk with children in a non-leading manner using open-ended questions to discuss everything that's to discuss everything that's going on. So again, because we know children don't lie about sexual abuse, we know that if a three-year-old is using language and saying things that are inappropriate um, and sexually inappropriate, the likelihood is they've been exposed to something inappropriate and that could be pornographic material or it could be that they've experienced something. And that's where the investigation um, comes in um, further and trying to decide. So it's not, it's, I, I don't want you to think about it as a, the three-year-old is against an adult because the three-year-old is a person who can give you information. It's just how you get that information. And we definitely try to be, um, we use the forensic interview as a way to try to tease that out. So if a child in a child care is engaging in self-stimulation, we are to allow it, and it's okay between one and another child. I'm certain child care license will not see it that way. It is a normal behavior, and you don't want to, you can ask them to stop. You can talk, so children can understand 
what behaviors they can do in certain spaces at a very young age. So children know the different ways, the rules they're at home, the rules they're at, child, at daycare. And so you can tell them that we don't do that here. That is something you can do at home, in privacy, in your, in your bedroom. It's not something, it's not appropriate to do that here. So in addition to teaching them and you want to make sure when you tell them, you're not telling them because it's a wrong thing to do. It's just inappropriate to do in the space that they're in. So you don't want to make them feel bad. So someone answered your question and said they've had a three-year-old who did it every day at nap time. And our rep said that we were doing the right thing by just asking her to stop. It's normal and you're not supposed to shame them on it. Not between two children. That's not what she said. So you need to make sure, exactly, you don't want to shame them. You want to make sure that you're letting them know. Because, again, it's their body. They're allowed to touch their body in any way that they want to. Um, you just talk about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate for the space that they're in. And that's the same thing I tell parents. Like, you don't masturbate in the living room. You can go to your bedroom. When you're done, wash your hands and come back and join the family. So you talk to them about that. that. And when I talk about normal sexual behaviors, normal exploratory behaviors between children of the same age, that again can certainly happen and can be normal. It doesn't mean one of them has been sexually abused. But if you see that happening, again, in the space that it's happening, you redirect the children. And if it's a normal behavior, they will be redirectable. You just tell them to stop. So I'm not saying let it all happen in inappropriate spaces. It's recognizing whether something is normal or abnormal and raises your suspicion for concerns of sexual abuse. Um, we have just a couple more minutes before the next session starts. Okay. Should I ask a few questions to complete the report to CPS? Uh, it, de it depends on the situation and the questions that you're asking, um, if you, how, what you need. So for the report to CPS, you just have to report what your concerns are, and then they ask you like other ancillary questions. So if a child is saying, I'm being hit with, by my mom, that is enough information for you to make a report to CPS. You don't need to find out when, how, why, that sort of thing. Um, the sexual abuse, the things, the most important thing there is to find out when the next time they have contact with the potential perpetrator because you don't want to send a kid home in a, in, a, in a terrible situation. So it really depends on the situation, whether or not you ask a few more questions. And again, the way that you ask it, it needs to be very open-ended. And depending on the age of the child, that's how you ask those different questions. So it's difficult to answer that one sort of like that. Some children will not trust a new person when then they clam up. Yeah, absolutely. And we know that. We definitely know that. And we take that into account. So some cases, so, you know, some kids tell me things that they don't say during their forensic interview, or they go to the forensic interview and they say things and they come and see me and they don't tell me anything. And that is totally fine. We understand that. And we understand the, um, the uh, development of children and what they will and will not do. And so when, you know, this process is not something that happens in isolation. So when a child, when a report is made to Child Protective Services, the CPS is involved. Medical personnel can be involved. Law enforcement can be involved. Um, the Children's Advocacy Center, where we do forensic interviews, can be involved. Their counseling can be involved. Uh, attorneys, can, the DA's office can be involved. So we all meet regularly to discuss cases that we are uh, stuck or have concerns about. And so it's not just one caseworker making a decision. You have the potential for all of these community partners who work in child maltreatment to look at all these cases and give and add all of their expertise because we're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to protect kids in our community. And so there's lots of things that happen once that investigation starts. It's not just a, a one process. It's a very complicated process. And so we recognize all the different aspects of kids and try to do that. Okay, I think, we're gonna, I think we're gonna have to end. Um, okay. Because the next session is about to start. But you can answer okay. in the comment if you want. You can type out an okay. answer or comment. Yeah. All right, thank you all so much for attending and we're gonna end this session and give you a minute to get over to the next session.